Hello and welcome again to my physical science online video lecture and lab supplement series. Today's video is a supplement video for the physical science labs. Specifically, it is a little bit of additional discussion and examples for the Blender Lab. And this is put together because there have been a few requests that I include some more examples for the lab portion of my course. So let's go ahead and start off by looking at what the lab instructions actually say. All right, we start off with, as usual, a list of the equipment that you're going to need to have to do this lab. You need a thermometer, a blender, some water, a stopwatch and some means of measuring just how much water you have. Basically, I give you a density conversion. One gram of water is the mass of one milliliter of water, and so one liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. This is because most people, I imagine, who are attempting to do this from home probably have something like a measuring cup present that can tell you how much volume of water you have in milliliters more easily than they have a scale that will tell you the mass in kilograms. So what we're going to do in this experiment here is ultimately you're going to be dumping the water into a blender and then running the blender and measuring how much heat is transferred to the water from the blender. And there's a variety of things that you need to know that you will have probably seen in your lecture in order to do this lab. Even if you haven't seen these in your lecture, you can always open up your textbook for physical science and look in specifically the chapters that have to do with the uh, heat and temperature and then the chapter that has to do with electrical circuits. So those would be chapters 5 and 8, and you might also want to know a little bit about power and energy, which is in the work and energy and power chapter, chapter 4 of your text. With that said, there are a few equations that you're going to need to know. So the first one that I have written up here is the equation that describes power for an ohmic resistor. So the power that an ohmic resistor is going to draw is given by the amount of current flowing through the resistor times the voltage drop across the resistor, which is also you can calculate using the voltage drop squared divided by the resistance. So why is this useful to us? Well, what you need to do is start by taking the blender and looking up what the manufacturer prints as the power for the blender. And then you also need to know what the voltage is from your power outlet. If you're living in the United States, as most of my students are, or somewhere else in North America, then the voltage from your wall plug is going to be 120 volts. If you live somewhere in Europe, then you're going to have some different amount of voltage, 220, 240 volts, depending upon Europe, parts of Africa, parts of South America, um, parts of Asia, maybe Australia, etc. So be sure that you know just how much voltage is standard for the country that you're living in. Now, what we're doing is basically running the blender for initially 10 seconds with the water in it and measuring how much the temperature of the water changes. And from this measurement, we can get how much energy has been added to the water. And from that, we get how much power is being applied to the water from the blender. So if you have a 1200 watt blender and you run it for 10 seconds, then you should estimate that you've got 12,000 joules that have basically of work that has been done by that blender. 
I'll show that calculation just in case you're wondering where this estimate is coming from. This is because in general power is defined as the amount of work done per unit time. So if we have a given power and a known amount of time that we run it for, then you can figure out how much work is done by multiplying the power times the time. So this was a 1200 watt uh, uh, blender and we're multiplying it by 10 seconds, which is how long it's being run for. So that should give us 12,000 joules. Remember that a watt is the same thing as a joule per second. So we're multiplying joules per second by seconds. Therefore, we should end up with joules. OK, so that is calculating a work done given a power and a time. That's sort of a predicted amount of work done, if you will, predicted amount of energy added. Experimentally, the thing that we're actually able to measure besides time is how much the temperature of the water changes and also how much the mass of the water is. So we use this equation, Q equals M C sub P delta T, where Q is the heat added to the water, which is basically how much energy, how much thermal energy are you putting into the water. So Q is equal to E is equal to P delta T. So heat is the energy added, is the amount of power of the blender times the amount of time that the blender is run for. M is how much water you have, it's the mass of the water. C sub P is what's called the specific heat of the water. It's 4,186 joules per kilogram Kelvin, or if you want to work in degrees C, 4,186 joules per kilogram degrees C. This is the more useful set of numbers, although most chemists would prefer to have answers in kilocalories per kilogram or calories per gram or some such thing. So the, the number that you really need is 4,186 joule per kilogram Kelvin, which is the same as 4,186 joules per kilogram degree C. You might want to, for the sake of interest, write down that it's also one kilogram kilocalorie per kilogram Kelvin, which is the same as a calorie per gram Kelvin. Delta T, big T in this case, is the change in temperature of the water. So let's look at how this equation kind of breaks down. So here I've written out the equation and you see it's heat or energy added is mass times specific heat times change in temperature. So the mass you measure, measure uh, using either a scale or volume times density. This is the density. The C sub P is given, given because it's a standard value for water. Standard value for water. This is assuming fresh water, of course. And it's 4,186 joules per kilogram times degree Celsius. Or if you want, it's a calorie per gram times degree Celsius. And then the last thing is the change in temperature and you have to measure this using a thermometer. Measure using thermometer. All right, so I suppose our second example therefore is to sort of see how we get each of these things and then do a calculation of this. So um, suppose you have, 
let's say 2.5 liters of water that you've added. And you measure the before temperature. So temperature, we'll call this, uh, let's say 20 degrees C before using the blender. And then after using the blender, you measure it at, let's say 24 degrees C after using the blender. So the question is, uh, let's say, let's to add on to this, we run the blender for, let's say, 10.0 seconds. Okay, so that's basically all the stuff that you could measure uh, directly in this experiment. So the question is, how much power do we measure? How much energy? Maybe we'll just say how much power. So how much power uh, did we measure for the blender? And the way that we do that is that there's several short, simple steps to answer this question. So this is a this question looks kind of complex because you don't see power anywhere in here. You don't even see energy directly anywhere in here. You do see the time, so that's nice. So let's look at this first from the problem solving string some equations together perspective, and then let's look at it from the operational perspective. If you know what you have to do to get this answer, here's the steps you take. Okay, the power, power is given by P, is work per unit time. Or it's, in other words, energy transferred per unit time. So this right here we would represent as a W or E or as the case may be Q divided by delta T. All right, so we have a delta T here. Delta T is given right here. Delta T is equal to 10.0 seconds. Q we don't have up here. So what we would use then is the equation that I wrote down for Q before. So Q is equal to m times c sub p times delta t. That's the only equation that you have that has a q in it other than this equation that we're using to find the power. If we're using this equation to find the power, we need another equation to find the energy or the heat. So here's this equation. So do we have a delta t? Do we have an m? Well, we're given a volume and we're also given some temperatures. So to get the delta T what we do is we take the time after and we or the temperature after excuse me and we subtract the temperature before. So that would be 24 degrees C is the temperature after 20 degrees C is the temperature before. So we have 24 degrees C minus 20 degrees C. So that is 4 degrees C. So we've got something to put right here. It's 4 degrees C. This one, of course, is given. So this is 4,186 joules per kilogram degree C. How do we get the mass? So the mass is still unknown. Well, we have the volume. This right here is a volume, or V. And we have the density. So density is mass per unit volume. So this is mass 
over volume and density for water is one kilogram per liter. Okay, so we have a value for the density. Rho represents density, in case you're wondering. So we can rearrange this equation right here to say that mass is equal to density times volume. So that means we have 2.5 liters, so we have one kilogram per one liter times 2.5 liters. This right here, by the way, you did in chapter one of your text in the first week of the lecture for those who are also taking my physical science lecture. So this right here is saying that the mass is 2.5 kilograms. All right, so this means that we can actually now calculate what the heat is, which means that we can calculate the power. So the heat transferred must be 2.5 kilograms times 4,186 joules per kilogram degree C times 4 degrees C. So you can throw all these guys into your calculator to get a number for the heat transferred. It's 2.5 times 4186 times 4. So it's 4, uh, 41,860. So that's how much heat has been transferred. 41,860 joules. All right, the power we were we had up here, power P is Q over delta T. So this is Q over delta T. So that's 41,860 joules divided by 10 seconds. And so that's 4,186 watts. So we've just calculated what the power of the blender that is needed to raise the temperature of the water by four degrees C in uh, 10 seconds for 2.5 liters of water. So again, let's look at what the process is. Let me write out what the process is for this entire example. Okay, so we want power. So step one is that uh, since power is equal to the heat transferred per time, see if we know the heat and the time. So see if you know, meaning see if you can measure directly Q and also delta T. This one you cannot, this one you can. So step two was determine, uh, determine Q and use the equation that we have for Q, M C sub P delta T. So now we have to ask, do we know the values for these guys? Yes, no, no. So three determine delta T, use delta T equals T after minus T before. So this is change in temperature. Change in temperature is the temperature after minus the temperature before. You can measure both of those using a thermometer. These are check marks, by the way, not V's. And these are an X meaning, no, I don't have it, in case you're wondering. OK, step four then is determine the mass, uh, assuming that you don't have a scale that you can just measure the mass with. 
you do actually have a scale that you can measure the mass with if you've been doing all the labs, by the way, because we already created a spring scale from which you could measure the mass um, by measuring how much it stretches the spring. But I'm going to assume that you've sort of torn that down already and don't want to have to redo that whole experiment. So if that's the case, you use uh, M or mass is equal to density times volume. So this you use, use measuring cup. And then this one right here is just simply one kilogram per one liter. That just is the density of water. Okay, so in other words, you have both of these. So by having both of these things, by, by knowing both of these things, in other words, you now have what the mass is. You now have what delta T is this thing right here, you also have a number for joules per kilogram degree C. So because you now know what the mass is and what the change in temperature is, you can calculate what the uh, heat added is. Since you now have the heat added and the time, you can calculate what the power is. So this is, I've listed these in order of the sort of process you go through to figure out what you need to do. You actually then start down here and work your way up to here to get the power. So we work down to figure out what it is that it is that we have to figure out. And then we work back up by figuring out these things in turn, measuring them, looking them up, etc. Okay, so that's how you do the, the uh, power. Okay, the other equation that we see here in the summary says that power is equal to current times voltage or is equal to voltage squared divided by resistance. So there's another law that could be written here called Ohm's law which says that voltage is equal to current times resistance. That's why we can write this equal sign in. In any case, I'm going to use the US voltage. We have our 1200 watts, or in the case of the example I just did, our 4186 watts. And we want to know what kind of current draw we have and what kind of resistance we have. So let's write out those equations again. P equals IV. This is power equals the current draw times the voltage drop. And that's also equal to the voltage drop squared divided by the internal resistance. So the things that you're going to be calculating are the current draw and the internal resistance. Because the voltage V is given by what country you happen to be living in, the standard voltage that a, that a uh, wall plug gives you. So this is a standard for US wall outlet. So that is where you get that from. If you happen to be living not in the US, then you might want to look up what the uh, actual voltage is coming out of the wall in the area that you're living in. So then the next thing after this is that we need to figure out I and we need to figure out R. I, which is the current we get using this first equation, P equals IV. Therefore, we can write that IV equals P and therefore I is P over V. So we can plug numbers in now. 4,186 watts divided by 120 volts. So let's 
plug in those guys. Um, so let's get this to the 4,186 watts level. Now we divide by 120 volts and we get 34.88333. So the current, therefore, I is 38.9 approximately amps. So the unit is amps if we're talking about current. All right, R is the internal resistance of the blender. So internal resistance of blender. And we use P equals V squared over R. So this means V squared, uh, excuse me, this means that uh, P times R is equal to V squared. So I'm multiplying an R. So this is a V squared over R times R. And so therefore the resistance is the voltage squared divided by the power. So that's 120 volts squared divided by 4,186 watts. So what does that give us? Uh, 120 squared gives us 14,400. Then we're going to divide that by 4,186 and you get 3.44. So this means that the resistance is approximately 3.44 ohms. So that's what the internal resistance of this blender is. Okay, that covers everything we need for the theoretical side of things. At this point, there are a couple loose ends to tie together that have to do with the experiment itself. So let's scroll down. Uh, the experimental instructions start off by saying, first do these theoretical calculations. Um, so look up what the manufacturer says the power is. If you look on the blender, it will usually say somewhere, a little label will say, this blender is so many watts. Write down what the voltage is. So if you're in the US, 120 volts. So calculate the current and the resistance. That's the two examples that I just did. And what this gives you is all the theoretical values for this blender. So next we do the experiment and there's two ways we're going to do it. There's a simple way in which you measure how much mass of water you have. In other words, get the volume and multiply it by the density. Then measure the temperature before turning it on. I'm labeling this as TI for T initial, the initial temperature. And then cover the blender, run it for 10 seconds, maybe let it sit for a second or two, and then go ahead and measure the temperature after. So T final is the temperature after running. Subtract this one from this one and you have the change in temperature. Calculate the heat as shown in the example. And now you've got your experimental values for uh, basically everything here. You can now calculate the power used by the blender experimentally. It's going to be this number divided by 10 seconds. So um, the, the loose end here is that we wanted to calculate a percent error. So how do you calculate a percent error? Well, you basically do as follows. You want to do percent error is equal to whatever the experimental value is minus the theoretical value. Uh, then take an absolute value so that you get a positive number whether this is bigger than this or smaller. And then I like to compare back to the experimental value. So it's basically how well does the theory fit the experiment rather than the other way around. 
other people will say, no, let's compare the experiment to the theory. Um, so you should divide by the experimental value and then multiply by 100%. So experimental minus theoretical over experimental. The other way around would be this minus this over theoretical. So experimental value is the experimental value for the power in this case. So the experimental power was 4,186 watts. Let's say that the theoretical value was given by that 1,200 watts uh, power that was listed above. So let's say for the sake of argument that it's 1,200 watts. Well, your percent error, therefore, is going to be 4,186 watts minus 1,200 watts divided by 4,186 watts. We take an absolute value in case this is negative, although you can see it's not going to be negative. We multiply that by 100%. So let's plug those guys into the calculator. 4,186 minus 1,200 divided by 4186 gives us 0.71333. So now we multiply by 100 to get the percent error, and it's 71.33. So approximately 71.3%. So this is our percent error for the measurement of or for the theoretical prediction of what amount of power is being transferred, uh, how much work is being transferred per unit time to the water. There's a little note here that basically says that some small fraction of the energy used by the blender is actually converted to temperature change in the water. That's basically just a true statement. I wouldn't expect 100% of the uh, energy used by the blender or of the work done by the blender to go just to heating the water. I would expect maybe 1 to 10%, although if you wait long enough and allow thermal equilibrium to happen between the motor and your blender, if it's not very well insulated and the water, then you might get a much larger percentage. In any case, at this point, you've seen examples for how to do everything on here, save for now we're going to look at the more thorough experiment. And in the more thorough experiment, what you're supposed to do is you run the blender for 10 seconds and measure the temperature. Then you write down the change in temperature, you calculate how much heat is added. Then you let it sit for a few seconds, maybe 10, 20 seconds, then you run it for another 10 seconds. So you will have run the blender for a total of 20 seconds, but it's in intervals of 10 and then another 10. You write down the temperature, calculate this stuff, run it for another 10, write down the temperature, calculate this stuff. By the way, my recommendation for how you should go about actually doing this, write down the temperature, run the blender for 10 seconds, write down the next temperature, run for 10 seconds, write down the next temperature, run for 10 seconds, write it down. Basically fill out this whole column. Then when you're done, after 10 whole runs worth of this, you can fill out this whole column here and from that, this whole column here. This is change in temperature and heat added. So this corresponds to Q, this corresponds to delta T. Um, Belt, uh, delta big T, I should say. You may want to rest the blender in between these 10 second runs for maybe 10 or 20 seconds just to avoid not overheating it. If you rest too long, what happens is you lose thermal energy. If you rest for too little, then you can risk sort of burning out the motor on your blender. So be careful when you do this. And uh, the other thing is that we already did the 10 seconds uh, experiment here. 
So if you've read all these directions and or watched this video in advance before doing the experiment, then you can actually maybe get through this step right here. And then this T final is actually the number that you can write in right here for the temperature after 10 seconds. Then instead of carrying out all these calculations right afterwards, I would in fact jump down here and finish out this table so that you don't have to redo the first 10 seconds. Then you can go up and do these calculations and then you can come down here and do this part. And, and so this brings me to the last loose end, which is that it asks about plotting heat added versus time and then it says that the slope of the graph is going to give you the power of the blender. So what is this going to look like? Here are the time values that you're using. The heat added you have to calculate from over here. Let's say that you finish out this graph. Maybe we're using a different blender now. Uh, the time is 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100 seconds. Okay, and so from here we ultimately calculate the amount of heat added, which is in joules. Obviously you can't have added anything before running the blender. That's why I actually filled in that first part of the table for you with zeros. Let's say that what you get is maybe, um, let's say 2,500 joules. Maybe this one right here is closer to 5,000. So maybe 5,020, 7,480 whatever, 10,000 joules has been added. Maybe here it's uh, 12,600. Maybe over here we're down more like uh, 15,100. Here maybe we get another uh, 17,490 and so on. So filling this thing out you get something like this. All right, so now you have to plot these values. Here's the line of best fit. Here is the heat added axis. Down here is the basically the time axis. Uh, time should be in seconds. So you'll have to make a scale you know, maybe this is in increments of 2,500. So it looks something like this. By the way, you should be using graph paper or Excel or or Open Office, etc., to make these graphs. I'm doing it this way just to show by hand how it looks like. Um, I don't have any nice graph paper that is sort of digitally available on this computer right now. So you're not supposed to just copy exactly what I'm doing. You're supposed to use graph paper so that you actually have a reasonable scale. Because I'm kind of guessing my scale should be an equal size for equal increment. And then up here would be the 25,000 mark. And then down here, one, two, three, four five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Whoops, this is a ten, not a double zero. All right, so now you make your plot and is basically doing some job like this. Okay, so now you add, you figure out a line of best fit using a ruler in the event that you are doing this by hand or you can use Excel to do it. So here's my line of best fit. I have to pick two points which are actually on this line of best fit. Since I'm doing this by hand and I don't have actually graph paper, I have to kind of guess at what two points might be. So I'm going to guess that this point right here is actually the point maybe 1.5 seconds comma, um, I don't know, 
3,750 or so joules. Maybe this one right here is, obviously I'm not running very well to scale here, but maybe this is like 9.5 seconds and um, 2,000, uh, excuse me, 23,750 joules or whatever. Okay, so the slope is always given by rise divided by run. So that's change in whatever's on the y versus change in whatever's on the x. So the y axis corresponds to basically this height. The x axis corresponds to this. So this one right here would be a change in the amount of time. This one would be a change in the amount of heat added. So we would have 23,750 joules minus 3,750. And then we're dividing that by the 9.5 seconds minus the 1.5 seconds. All right, so this right here goes here. This right here goes here. This one right here is the first one for the run. This one right here is the second one for the run. So therefore, the slope in this case is going to be given by, uh, let's see here, this would be 20,000 joules divided by 8.0 seconds. So if you throw that into your calculator, 20,000 divided by 8 gives us 2,500. So this is basically saying 2,500 joules per second. And this unit right here is the same thing as a watt. So the slope right here is actually telling us the power. All right, so we've just made a nicer measurement of what the power of the blender is, or at least the power of the blender as applied to the water is. Okay, so that's how you deal with this question about figuring out the slope. So from there, you can go back again and calculate an experimental value for the current and of the resistance, and then you can check the percent error. That actually finishes out the lab for us. So you can basically stop watching here if you'd like and have everything you need to do the lab. With that said, I will add one last little sort of addendum to this video, which is that I mentioned before when I was doing this graphing thing that I was doing it by hand. You should do it either on Excel or by graph paper. So I'm just going to show what this is going to look like on Excel. All right, so here I've written in the same data that I just recorded before. So what we're going to do is we're going to go insert and we need to make a chart and specifically the one we want is a scatter plot. So here I've inserted a scatter plot and actually this kind of did more than I wanted it to. It's already put in everything on the right axes but um, in case you don't get to do that, in case the axes are wrong or something, if you don't have it selected right, it's going to show you a blank graph like this. You right click on it, it pulls up that menu that I said, and you basically go select data. So the data that we're going to select is first the x values, which was the time axis. Then secondly, we want to do the y values, which is the heat axis. Click OK. And so now we're good. There's the line that we want. We can do stuff like edit the axis. Um, so format axis. You can enter stuff like if you don't like the values that it's on, you can change what the maximum is, all that stuff. I was going to basically add on to this a trend line. So I right clicked and chose add trend line. I click linear because that's the kind of line I want. And then I'm going to display the equation on the chart. That's the main thing that I need to have. 
And so here we have the equation displayed on the chart. So looking back now on this graph, you see that it's given us an equation y equals mx plus b. This one right here, the b, you can kind of ignore because you know that the real answer is that it goes through 0, 0. And in fact, if you want, you can make it so that the trend line is forced to go through the intercept of 0, 0. And so now you have just y equals mx, where m is the slope, y is the heat, x is the time. So you see that the slope is 250 from this graph. And so you get basically the same number that I calculated uh, when factoring for the fact that the calculation should be in increments of 10. So that's basically how you go about doing this graphing part on Excel. You can, of course, do stuff like adding the uh, title to the graph and labeling your axes and all that, which you should do. It's not really the point of this particular video, though. So with that said, I think you now have more than enough to get done with this experiment. So thanks for watching.